All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Julian Goldstein. Um, thank you for tuning in. Uh, I have the pleasure of being the chair of the Howard University Students for D.C. Statehood Chapter, um, a youth-led advocacy group uh, seeking to have participatory, participatory uh, democracy and lobbying for uh, statehood here in the district. Um, so on this call, we have two representatives leading the main statehood effort here in, uh, here in the here in America. Um, representing uh, the Puerto Rico statehood delegation, we have Mr. George Garcia, uh, Mr. George Laws Garcia, excuse me, who serves as the executive director of the Puerto Rico Statehood Council, uh, Washington DC based, uh, 501c4 nonprofit dedicated to achieving uh, equality for, over the, for the over 3 million uh, US citizens living in Puerto Rico. Um, his past roles of um, also involved working over 15 years as an experienced uh, public policy and government affairs expert, um, working to advise state governors, members of Congress, federal agencies, and other uh, national nonprofit organizations on a broad range of issues, including ending territory status and making Puerto Rico the newest state of the union. Representing Washington, D.C., we have Mr. or Dr. Oye Oaliwa, um, who is the current Democratic nominee for the district's um, representative. Uh, because Washington, D.C. is not a state, it's often uh, given the shadow role. Um, uh, more about his background, uh, Oye aims to expand the conversation beyond voting representation to educating uh, a broad range of district voters on how statehood affects local lawmaking, as well as independence, to also include the, the criminal justice system in Washington, D.C. Oye also has past experience in advocating for district statehood where he lobbied congressmen, con Congress members to co-sponsor H.R. Uh, 51, the leading statehood bill for the District of Columbia. So we'll a uh, quick format, and then I'll hand it over to our moder moderator, Mr. Lionel Dolliv uh, Donovan. Um, so we will have four main segment topics um, to get the conversation going between Oye and George to get respective thoughts and feedbacks on how to expand American democracy. And then after that, we'll have uh, one, uh, roughly 20 minute Q and A where we will be, where Lionel will be posing questions that came from you, the students, viewers, and local statehood activists. Uh, Lionel, over to you. All right. Um, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Julian. I really appreciate it. And thank you all for, for coming out, or I guess staying in for this, uh, for this call at this point. And um, I know you all are very busy, so I guess we will get right into it. Um, and first, I guess we'll, uh, we'll start with you, Oye. And uh, the, one of the big topics going on right now is COVID-19, right? Yes. And uh, we've seen how this, uh, how this virus has just swept across the country. And we've seen states taking different uh, approaches to dealing with the spread. And some have been more successful than others. But um, it's no secret that you know, officials have been fighting an uphill battle when it comes to dealing with uh, the spread of this virus. So, um, so I wanted to ask you, uh, how much of an impact do you think uh, DC being alienated from Congress uh, versus being an official state uh, would, would have on, um, on the infrastructure of public health? Like how would DC being a state, how would that help us deal with the spread of this virus? All right. Lionel, thank you so much for that question. And absolutely thank you guys for having me here. Um, as we noticed, DC was negatively affected by coronavirus, just like any other area in, in the United States. However, because we were treated as a territory and not as a state, we lost over 60% of funding compared to our neighbors in Maryland and Virginia. That lack of resources really impacted our response. So number one, we didn't have the resources to put the healthcare infrastructure into the most vulnerable populations. We also didn't have control over our National Guard because we're not a state. So we had a, a gap in response. Lastly, without having representatives in office, we were unable to craft a 
a very good response to the coronavirus as well as get our equal fair share of resources. So we were further marginalized by residents not having the resources and the direct payments to combat the economic as well as the health disparities caused by the coronavirus. Once DC becomes a state, we'll not only be able to be treated like any other American in the country, we'll also be able to have our own representatives bring our values and perspectives to the future pandemics and future situations, just like the coronavirus is showing right now. All right, all right. Uh, Mr. Garcia, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, not just in regards to DC, but also Puerto Rico, because they are also trying to you know, achieve statehood. Um, so yeah, would you have any thoughts to weigh in? Well, thank you, thank you, Lionel, for the question, and, and thank you, Noah, uh, and everyone else, uh, Julian, who, who helped organize this from the um, DC uh, statehood student group. Um, just quick point of clarification: is Laws Garcia. Hispanics have uh, more than one last name. Sometimes I'm one of those people. So um, just just to make sure we're we're clear on that front. Um, so you know. What's interesting is that as a territory of the United States, uh, under the Territorial Clause of the Constitution, which is uh, Article uh, 4, Section 3, uh, the Congress has the explicit authority to make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory. And, and what that means is that they have the capacity to um, essentially legislatively discriminate against US citizens who live in the territory uh, based on uh, their plenary powers, which are granted by the Constitution, as well as the way that the Supreme Court has interpreted uh, that you know constitutional law in a series of cases uh, over the course of the last you know 120 some years, um, the effect of that is that in Puerto Rico, um, when federal laws are approved that provide uh, funding, whether it's for healthcare in this case of COVID or any other issue. Um, the inclusion of the U.S. citizens of Puerto Rico is not automatically, um, you know, uh, something that happens. There has to be specific legislative language that explicitly includes uh, Puerto Rico uh, and or the other territories. And oftentimes um, the formulas that are selected for how to treat territories like Puerto Rico are different. And obviously the difference isn't something that's to our advantage. We don't get more money than everyone else. The difference is to our disadvantage. So it's an effective form of structural discrimination against the, the US citizens that live in the territory. Um, the, the impact of that in Puerto Rico uh, during COVID has been felt um, to a certain extent in terms of the emergency funding that's been provided by Congress in the past supplemental packages. But the most significant impact is actually the, the cumulative uh, um, uh, impact on our health systems infrastructure on the island of getting less funding. So we've been getting less funding for our Medicaid uh, recipients in Puerto Rico and our Medicare recipients of Puerto Rico for the last you know, 40 years. And, and that means that you know, our hospitals were already weaker when it, you know, uh, the, the COVID you know, crisis hit. Um, our healthcare community was already um, smaller in terms of providers, um, and, and that's that's devastating. Okay, and um, that actually brings me to another uh, uh, question uh, that I would like to you know, start with you, Mr. Laws Garcia. Um, and uh, basically, you know, when it comes to uh, awarding statehood to places like Puerto Rico and D.C., um, why so? You know, if you're if there are all these hurdles that you know that port, uh, that these territories have to go through in order to secure funding, and if it's so hard to to get access to these fundings as territories and as districts, um, why hasn't there been any any movement to to make these places states? Like, what do you think are some of the the barriers towards statehood when it comes to Puerto Rico and D.C.? Sure. So. You know, there has been movement. It's just been very slow movement. <laughs> um, unfortunately, um, having worked in Congress uh, for, for a number of years, I can tell you that um, the capacity of Congress to proactively address issues is very limited right now. Uh, unfortunately, the structure of Congress as it currently 
uh, exists is really more of a reactive body than a proactive body in the vast majority of cases. And um, the, the barriers uh, to the advancement of uh, statehood um, in the case of DC and Puerto Rico in the legislative sense, the congressional legislative sense, um, they have different dynamics, right? So obviously um, there's a democratic deficit that exists for both jurisdictions. We're both United States citizens. Uh, we both get taxation without representation, even though Puerto Rico's tax situation is different than DC. Um, there is discrimination against both jurisdictions in uh, federal programs, although DC gets more e treated more equally in more programs than, than Puerto Rico does. Um, but the barriers are really uh, different. You know, there's a set of political barriers that have been, um, you know, uh, significant factors. Um, you know, the look at the main uh, opponent for DC statehood right now. Um, you know, that, that's that's Mitch McConnell. He's the you know, uh, majority leader in the Senate. And in his eyes, um, he lumped DC and Puerto Rico statehood as, um, you know, equally evil twins in his, mm. in his worldview, because he's actually not looking at this from a civil rights perspective. He's not looking at this from a perspective of the health of American democracy or our country's founding values, which are government by the consent of the governed. I mean, that's literally what it says in our Declaration of Independence. He's looking at this from a partisan political perspective. So th there are those who you know, have uh, presented those kind of objections to uh, both Puerto Rico and DC statehood, but it's different. In Puerto Rico, you know, there is bipartisan support for um, our statehood admission process. It it's been a historic reality. Um, you know, it's evolved over time, but, but it's been pretty consistent. Um, for DC right now, you guys have advanced in the legislative process past the, the House passage, uh, but you know, it's on a straight uh, democratic partisan basis. So you know, those are some of the political dynamics. The other ones have you know, uh, other factors. Um, in Puerto Rico, um, there's people who look at the jurisdiction mm -hmm. and think that um, you know, there's economic reasons why Puerto Rico shouldn't be admitted as a state, um, which, you know, they believe uh, that admitting Puerto Rico as a state would cost the federal government money. Um, but what's ironic about that is that it actually ends up costing the federal government more money to keep us as a territory because it limits us from developing to our full economic potential, which is only available if we actually have the equal basis upon which to compete with the rest of the states and uh, the global economy. And, and that's only about right. mm -hmm. David. So I'll, I'll just pause there. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. It was very, uh, very informative. And actually, you touched on something that I, I wanted to go into. And um, I was wondering if I could get your, uh, your thoughts on this, uh, Mr. Oleo. Um, in regards to seeing this not only as a civil rights issue and also um, in regards to uh, legislation, uh, right. right? Because as it stands right now, um, both DC and uh, Puerto Rico in every practical sense um, operate as states, um, right? Like they are still able to, you know, uh, you know, they still govern, you know, a wide uh, range of people, a lot of people and everything, but they still seem to have to defer to the federal government uh, when it comes to their courts, uh, especially like, especially in DC. And they don't have, uh, and with DC, they don't have a representative that can vote in the House or the Senate, uh, but there are still so many people here. So it feels as though they, uh, they aren't represented. And um, mm -hmm. another thing is that, um, that the federal government can actually come in and uh, through the House rule, they can actually negate or nullify some of the laws that DC uh, leaders put out for the district. So, um, so I wanted to get your thoughts on that. So, you know, with that being said, um, how, how uh, I would say, how does that really affect lawmaking in DC when the people that are that have the final say on the laws don't actually live in the district? Absolutely, and thank you for asking that question. At the end of the day, when it comes to statehood, the biggest thing to realize is it's about self-governance and it's about control of our own lives. 
You know, a lot of folks in Washington, D.C. don't fully understand that the federal government has so much interference in our day-to-day -day lives, whether it's our lawmaking, whether it's our resources, whether it's the ability to, you know, just live without interference of federal um, interventions for people that we came and vote for. To double back a little bit on um, the previous question, at the end of the day, a lot of political maneuvering, a lot of political issues are maxed by their own philosophical differences. So throughout history, when Utah was fighting for statehood, on the backdrop of things, there was a lot of differences between the religious differences between Mormonism and the rest of America. Although we have protections in our laws for allowing us to um, practice whatever religion we want. Whether it's Dakota or Hawaii and our ethnic differences, they use political differences to mask their obvious differences in the people. Same thing with DC, our demographics, the way we vote, a lot of that is being used as scapegoats to denying a statehood. When it comes to our criminal justice system and our lawmaking ability, we're fighting for statehood not only to be able to vote, but also be able to have our own autonomy, our own ways to rule ourselves. I believe DC residents are smart enough and capable enough to make their own decisions. Okay, and, um, and how do you think that this, uh... And how do you think moving forward, because uh, as uh, Mr. Laws Garcia was saying, um, that the call for statehood for DC made it past the House, but there's right. still some work to be done. Um, how do you push that conversation forward? Absolutely. We have to tie our issues to the issues that people care about today. Right now, when it comes to essential policies like Medicare for all, universal health care, about more just tax system about being able to shape America to the country mm -hmm. that you want things the way we want it to be. I do believe that having our own representation and having the DC's values input on our lawmaking make a big difference and it helps shape America to the way we want it to be. I believe when we tie our issues of today with our own issues in DC, I believe we will all move in the same direction. Okay, uh, Mr. Laws Garcia, same question. How do we move the conversation forward in regards to statehood uh, for DC and Puerto Rico? Sure, you know, I think there's there's an important point that uh, needs to be needs to be clarified, which is that um, constitutionally, DC and Puerto Rico are in different situations, right? If you actually look at the structure of the Constitution, um, there is a clause that specifically discusses the district as the seat of government, whereas Puerto Rico falls under the territorial clause of the constitution. So, um, you know, procedurally, uh, those individuals who do not, you know, support uh, the full enfranchisement and equal enfranchisement of all American citizens, which is something that we definitely support as the Puerto Rico statehood movement, um, you know, they're gonna hang their hat on that. And you know, if you look at the um, that the official statement of administration policy by uh, the Trump White House um, after the DC statehood bill's passage, you know, it specifically talks about the um, the constitutionality of um, DC's admission and the aspects of it that have to deal with. Um, you know, the existing right to vote for president, which is enshrined in a constitutional amendment, right? So, you know, there are things like that that are different. In the case of a territory, there, you know, we don't really have any of those kind of structural constitutional concerns. The statehood admission clause is, is pretty simple and straightforward uh, for territories. Um, but I do think that the reality is um, that if America as a country wants to make sure that we live up to our values of, you know, equal rights under the law, we have to figure out a way past, you know, those uh, hurdles, whatever they may be, to provide that for the citizens of our capital, as well as the people who have not, you know, resided in territories for the last 120 years. Um, and, and that's something that is, is, is very clear. You know, in terms of how to proceed uh, in, in Congress, I think that, you know, right now, the most important thing is to increase the awareness mm -hmm. of our fellow citizens in the rest of the states. Uh, because obviously, um, you know, both DC residents and Puerto Rico residents 
don't have the power to, you know, leverage our political force in Congress to, you know, force action on this, particularly in the Senate. Um, so the only way in which uh, DC mm -hmm. statehood and Puerto Rico statehood are going to advance is if we can, you know, reach out to and tie in with other national issues that are happening that, you know, the residents of other states really care about and that resonate with them and, you know, build a, a broader base of support so that those citizens can um, compel their members of Congress to be active supporters um, of these issues. Um, you know, we can hold all of the referendums that we want and, you know, Puerto Rico is planning another one in November. I think that's important. We need to support that every single time that we get a chance to, you know, say no to being second class citizens. That's you know, really important, say yes to equality through statehood. Um, so so that is, is something else that we can do. Um, uh, but really, I think that the core of it is building out mm -hmm. a, you know, political base of support with other stateside residents that can, you know, use their political pressure on, on their elected officials. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and that actually leads me to the last thing. We'll uh, cap it off. Uh, well, what do you think are some other steps that can be uh, done or some other solutions to get DC uh, that much closer to statehood? I think we need to fully make the case that this is not something new. We can follow the Tennessee plan and make sure we get the majority of Congress and get the right representatives and the right senators and the right White House that reflects our values. We need to make sure we get senators to get on board with DC statehood. Well, I'm sorry, before we continue, uh, what exactly is the Tennessee plan? So the Tennessee plan was, the, was how Tennessee became a state, how mm -hmm. we just need a majority of the Congress as well as the White House signature to get into the union. Um, if we follow the same pattern in terms of shadow representatives, shadow senators, and then with due time and the right votes and the right legislation and the right legislators, they were able to gain access. That's the same thing with DC. One thing I also wanted to point out is that our constitution is a living document. It's not set in stone. Had it been set in stone, things that are happening today wouldn't be possible. Women wouldn't be allowed to vote. Black folks would be counted just for representation, but they wouldn't be allowed to vote either. So we need to also understand that we evolve as a country. Right now, our culture is evolving faster than our rules, regulations, and our governing body is. And that's because we're not always putting fire to feet to the fire. We're not always making sure that our country reflects our values. Once DC is made a state and DC state has achieved, we'll be closer to making the country that we want that reflects our values. All right, that's perfect. And uh, I know that this topic is something that we could probably get into all night and everything, but I think we might have to, uh, have to end it there for now. And um, I know that some of our viewers have some questions that they would like to, to ask us. Um, so um, I think we are going to go into, into the Q&A session of our, of, our, um, of our meeting. So uh, I think the way it would be set up right here. Um, if you have uh, any sort of question that you would like to ask us, uh, you could just send it to us in the chat and we could uh, we'll be sure to ask it to our two speakers. So does it, if you want to uh, type your question out and you can send it to us and we can read it off and uh, you can send it to me and we'll give it to uh, George and Oye. All right, so we have one already coming in and um, all right, this one's coming to us. Um, and it's how important is autonomy over local tax dollars, especially in our current climate? And what kind of solutions could become available uh, to the residents if we, had, uh, if we had more control over our tax dollars? Uh, Oye, I think we'll start with you. Great, thanks for asking that question. They go, they go hand in hand. And right now for DC residents, we're already paying the taxes. So, the ability to be living autonomously is key because it allows us DC residents to make full, bold laws and policies that we know won't be interfered by the federal government. A few years ago, we tried to create a needle exchange program, which would reduce the risk of HIV and bloodborne pathogens being passed around. 
because of partisan reasons, the federal government got involved and discontinued that plan and it put our residents in a further risk. And it actually increased our, our health care disparities because certain people were not living safe measures. Things like that, small little things that would normally just go through or more liberal policies is what's holding us back right now. We can't make our own laws. Although, you know, it is important to make sure that we're getting our value back for what we pay for, it's also critically important that we're also able to make our own laws and be able to see DC for what we want it to be, have it reflect our values and not the values of the White House. Okay, and uh, Slaus Garcia, uh, same question. How would, uh, you know, how would Puerto Rico having more control over their tax dollars, how would that help them? How would that benefit things? So, you know, one of the things that's really interesting is that as, as a territory, uh, because of the fact that Congress can treat us unequally under federal laws, uh, but we're U.S. citizens, which means that we can travel freely back and forth whenever we want to anywhere else in the country, uh, one of the effects that that has had over time is that um, individuals, by their nature, mm -hmm. pursue the best opportunities for their families um, and for themselves and for their development. So, you know, uh, we've had different waves of uh, migration of, you know, citizens from Puerto Rico coming to the mainland. Um, and uh, at this point in history, 122 years into the relationship, you know, we have about 5.8 million Puerto Ricans living stateside and only about 3 million Puerto Ricans left on the island. Um, and uh, for our local elected officials, you know, there's a huge pressure to provide the same level of, uh, you know, uh, economic support and, you know, program support uh, that government, you know, provides everywhere else in the country. Um, because obviously people talk to their families and if they're, you know, living in New Jersey or, you know, in, uh, uh, Florida or in you know Texas or wherever they're going to be saying hey you know this is what we're, we're getting over here and in Puerto Rico since we don't get the same federal treatment but we still have people knowing that this is what we should get what has caused the huge perverse incentive for the state government to get into an unsustainable debt situation in 2016 that it exploded into a debt crisis where the government of Puerto Rico basically admitted that we couldn't pay back our uh, state debts. And Congress, instead of actually addressing the root cause of Puerto Rico's territorial uh, you know, status, which is why we get treated unequally and why this debt you know, built up, they actually imposed more colonialism. So they actually appointed a federal um, uh, oversight board and control board, which is basically right now um, governing over the uh, authority of the local elected officials in Puerto Rico. Um, and, and that's uh, right now a hugely controversial issue. It's impacting, you know, all uh, kinds of different issues from healthcare to education to basic public services like, you know, policing, transportation. Um, so having uh, statehood would basically allow us to fully govern all of those, you know, uh, state level issues for ourselves without having an unaccounted and unelectable uh, that's appointed by the federal government deciding that for us. So that's, that's incredibly important. Okay, and uh, I actually wanna uh, go back to one of the points that you, were <clears throat> that you were talking about earlier, which has been a subject of controversy for some time, and that is policing. Um, one of our viewers has, uh, has uh, put out the question, how would statehood affect uh, DC and Puerto Rico's control over lo local law enforcement, especially with the recent use of, you know, National Guard that was sent to Lafayette Park and, you know, what everything that's been going on in Portland. Um, how, how would uh, statehood affect law enforcement? I would love to jump in. Oh. It's all about it's all about control. It's all about being able to control our own resources. Right now, given that we are in a federal city, not a state, we don't control what goes on in DC. We have an attorney general, Carl Racine, that prefers having diversion programs for the youth so they can learn from their mistakes without being punished severely. Currently, we have a White House that prefers tough on crime tactics that over polices communities of color. That also over incarcerates young people, setting them up for disastrous futures. 
if once DC becomes a state, we'll be able to create a more intuitive, nuanced, and productive crime and punishment system in which, like I say, that DC residents will be able to learn from their mistakes without being having their futures crippled. Now, when it comes to local policing, we have far more control of our resources. President Trump deployed the National Guard against his own people during a protest. Once DC becomes a state, that can't happen. We, have, we will be able to control our National Guard. They won't be able to fight us while we're protesting peacefully. Okay. Um, and George, uh, do you have any thoughts weighing in as far yeah, as? Yeah, so, you know, it, it's, it's interesting because um, the situation is, is a bit different in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. um, the control over our National Guard is something that the governor has on the island. Um, so, so that's not really a significant concern. Um, but one concern that um, does impact Puerto Rico in terms of law enforcement, federal law enforcement specifically, is that as a uh, maritime uh, border for the United States, as America's Caribbean border, Puerto Rico is obviously the subject of a significant amount of, you know, uh, you know, potential uh, criminal networks trying to enter the United States because we're part of the U.S. Customs Zone. So once you're inside Puerto Rico, you know, getting to Oklahoma and Texas, DC or, you know, Philadelphia, you don't have to pass through customs to do that. Um, and one of the challenges that we've seen on the island is that since we aren't a state, we haven't been treated equally in the amount of focus that uh, federal law enforcement has given to the challenges on the island versus other border jurisdictions, like in the south of the United States. Um, and that's that's absurd. We, you know, the value of the life of a U.S. citizen in Puerto Rico is equal to the value of the U.S. Uh, life of a U.S. citizen in Texas or, you know, um, Arizona. Right. Uh, but unfortunately, as a territory, that isn't the way in which the you know federal law enforcement resources have been distributed. Okay. And under statehood, we would have a much greater capacity to ensure uh, a more proportional distribution of federal law enforcement resources to actually address um, the threats confronting the U.S. citizens of Puerto Rico because we are America's Caribbean border. Okay, and uh, staying in Puerto Rico, uh, we have another question coming out. Um, they were talking about D.C.'s referendum in 2016. Um, around 86% of D.C. residents were in favor of statehood. And what do you think the outcome of the referendum that's being held in Puerto Rico in November, do you, do you think we'll have the same kinds of numbers? Well, you know, it, it's interesting because there's already been two uh, referendums in the last uh, eight years in Puerto Rico. In 2012, we had one where uh, two questions were asked. The first question was, uh, do you support continuing as a territory, yes or no? And 53% of the voters uh, said no. And then the second question is, which one of the non-territorial options do you prefer? That was 63% uh, said statehood. And then in 2017, we had another one that was between statehood, uh, continuing as a territory or independence. And in that one, 97% of voters that participated um, uh, chose uh, statehood. Um, although the national media and many opponents of statehood have said that that's not valid because only 23% of voters participated, which is kind of uh, ridiculous because in a democracy, it's always the majority of the people who actually participate in an election that get to decide. Otherwise, you would never be able to make any decision because you'd always be wondering, well, what about the majority of people who didn't participate? Um, so in November, um, I have the expectation that voters, since they're being asked for the first time, uh, specifically and exclusively, whether or not they want Puerto Rico to be ad admitted as a state, and the only answers are yes or no, that we will get a majority vote for yes, but I'm not sure what percentage you know that will have. Um, the the key thing is that it's over uh, 50 percent um, because there's no constitutional requirement that you have to have anything other than a you know clear majority for statehood. 
Okay, that's fair. Um, all right, and coming back to DC, uh, Oye, uh, I wanted to ask you, would you like to see Congress work on DC statehood in the first 100 days? And if so, how would you convince those that aren't necessarily on board to, to back DC statehood? Absolutely. I believe having DC statehood being a hundred day, first hundred day issue is critical. It's going to take a lot of political, um, political, a little bit of political power, or, you know, just a little bit of, you know, political currency to enter in a new state of DC. And I believe it is critical to do so. And I think it, the only way it would happen is if all of the majority of Democratic senators are on board with it. So we have to elect the right senators. We have to also make sure the White House turns Democratic. In the past, due to our increased efforts in DC statehood, we actually had every single Democratic nominee, including nominee Joe Biden, to support DC statehood. One thing we want to do is eliminate the filibuster. So if we have a clear majority of senators who support DC statehood, we'll be able to get that through. I think it's important to make it a 100-day issue because it's going to take a lot of time, it's going to take a lot of energy, it's going to take a lot of education. As the next representative of DC, I plan on creating the opportunity for education. So DC residents will understand how our life will change by having a state, and people outside of DC will understand how the United States will change by having DC be in the 51st state. Okay, and speaking of uh, of education, one thing I wanted to bring up was uh, students. Someone uh, wrote into us and was saying, um, "What does student statehood support uh, look like? Uh, not just in D.C. but in Puerto Rico." So students have been critical in getting us this far. We have lobbied inside of Capitol Hill. Students have gone to Iowa to challenge nominees. They have spread the word on social media. The internet has made the world a much smaller place. So young people, the millennials, have really been the key factor of getting us this close to, to becoming a state. So I want to thank them. I also want to let everybody know the fight isn't over. I think the next step is if you don't live in Washington, D.C., contacting your representation, whether it's your senators or your House representative, um, representatives. Just getting them involved and having them realize that it's not just a 700,000 person problem. It's a one nation issue, having DC not being a state. I mean, we fought wars over taxation with our representation. It's time to make DC a state. All right, uh, Mr. Laws Garcia, any thoughts? Yeah, no, definitely. I think that there is a generational turning point on this issue uh, that, that is, is starting to show uh, real legs. Um, in the past, there have been other issues uh, nationwide um, that have have shifted over time because a new generation has come into power and consciousness and awareness. And I think that uh, the issue of citizen equality and equal rights and voting rights uh, for uh, the U.S. citizens of Puerto Rico and, and D.C. It is an issue that falls in line with a lot of the calls for equality that we've seen become uh, issues that have majority support uh, nowadays in America. Um, uh, as far as you know, state uh, uh, um, stateside student groups, um, there's a association called the Puerto Rico Statehood um, Students Association (PRSSA). They've been very active in past uh, years. Um, right now, they're uh, kind of restructuring and retooling ahead of the uh, upcoming uh, November uh, plebiscite results. Um, but they've had chapters in, you know, universities uh, across the United States, including, you know, some in the district. And, and they really provide a, a vital uh, amount of support, uh, not only for the capacity to bring physical presence to events and demonstrations, which of course now under the COVID situation are a lot more limited, um, but what they also have is the capacity to spread messages virally, to use their social media to create awareness about that. And our organization, um, the Puerto Rico State Head Council, we've set up a platform called PR51st.com. Um, and uh, through that platform, we have a Facebook page, we have a Twitter account, we have Instagram, and we're constantly putting out content and information that students 
like the people that, that are you know, on this call uh, and other students who support equality uh, for all US citizens, whether it's in DC or in Puerto Rico, they can go there, they can sign up for their, you know, uh, our, our email list and you know, we'll be providing information on there and also providing specific opportunities for them uh, to engage other people in their networks to send messages to uh, voting representatives on, on our issues. I think one of the key things is that, um, you know, students have a lot more power than they give themselves credit for, but they actually have to go out and use it. And, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to empower our advocates um, uh, to do that. And we, we do think that um, that's what's gonna, you know, tilt the, the edge of history in the right direction. Okay. Um, I kind of want to touch on uh, what you were saying as far as networks and what, uh, and what Oya was talking about in regards to, you know, the internet mm -hmm. making things smaller. And I think that's something that we can really apply to the rest of the world. Um, as it stands right now, we have another question that's coming in. They're saying that DC is currently a member of the Unrepresented Nations and People's Organization. Um, it, do you know if, uh, if Puerto Rico is doing anything to expand their efforts and garner support on an international stage? Sure. So, um, you know, th there have been a numerous efforts through the United Nations uh, Committee, you know, Subcommittee on Decolonization to address the issue of Puerto Rico uh, and, and our territorial colonial status. Uh, unfortunately, my, my sense is that that body has been uh, devalued in its legitimacy because of the composition of its leadership. So in, in, in reality, um, it ends up not really being a very effective tool to generate the uh, clarity of uh, debate in that issue. A lot of the times um, the issue uh, is actually portrayed as a, an issue of Puerto Ricans being, you know, foreign country, which is just not the case. Um, and there have been, however, other efforts that have been more targeted uh, utilizing the Organization of American States and a number of cases that have been brought forward uh, under the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Um, and I know that DC's also had some success in, in uh, those forums. And while uh, creating that international awareness and support is good, um, ultimately these are actually domestic political issues and it's most incumbent on us to actually get the support of our fellow citizens, because they're the ones who can effectively pressure uh, Congress to take action on this. You won't ever have a series of foreign ambassadors or foreign presidents lining up, you know, to hold America's feet to the fire because DC doesn't have representation or Puerto Rico is, you know, a, a modern day colony. I, I just don't see that happening. But I do see our fellow citizens, you know, standing up and saying, we need all Americans to have equal citizenship. Okay, um, so Oleo, any thoughts? Yeah, so um, one thing I wanted to bring up about DC statehood, this whole conversation, especially about bringing this out outside of DC, denying DC residents is voter suppression. We were just able, we were able to elect a mayor 60 years ago. It took a constitutional amendment to vote for a president meaning that if you have a grandmother or grandfather who's over 70 years old, they remember a life in DC when they couldn't elect a president or a mayor. So we have to tie our message with the message of the times as well. There's a lot of efforts out there, including Stacey Abrams fighting for voter suppression. We have to tie our fight to what's going on on a national scale as well. Because denying DC residents statehood and a vote is just a long line of a history of voter suppression. We've come a long way, but this is also, like I said, there's a fight that still needs to be fought and we're as close as we've ever been to statehood. Our efforts needs to be activated so we can get past the finish line. Okay, and actually that's something that I, uh, I wanted to talk about, I wanted to bring up uh, in regards to DC. Uh, like you were saying, you can't ignore the demographics of the district, um, you know, and the history that, that DC has played in uh, in the black community in the U.S., uh, do you think that that might be um, that might contribute to some of the resistance that uh, D.C. residents have had when it comes to being awarded statehood? Absolutely, I do believe there's a fairly unknown. 
like I mentioned before, when it came to Utah's struggle for statehood, a lot of it had to do with their differences of Mormonism. When it came to Hawaii, a lot of it had to do with their ethnic background. I do believe our history and our demographics have gone in the way of our statehood. However, with the right fight and where we are now, we can overcome this. You know, we can, we can defeat all examples of suppression or bigotry or even just fear of the unknown. We have the power and the ability if we come together to overcome this and become the 51st state. And I believe all of our efforts have gone this far with a little bit more targeted energy. We're going to make, we're going to pass it. We're going to become a state. Okay. All right. If, if I could add something onto that, that kind of builds on uh, what Oya was saying, you know, our country in the past several months has gone through some immensely challenging moments that have really been eye opening for us in a number of ways. Obviously the coronavirus has upended life for everyone in one way or another, but we've also had a, um, a, a significant, um, you know, resurgence of uh, America's attention on the issue of uh, police brutality. Um, and, and really the instance of uh, police brutality that happened with George Floyd and with Breonna Taylor and, you know, all of the other instances that we keep you know, seeing have been galvanized by this, you know, Black Lives Matter movement uh, in a way that has actually pushed America to recognize some of the forms of structural racism that still exist to this day. And, you know, whereas it's very visible to see how police brutality, which you can film with a camera, is a form of structural racism that literally kills people, it's a lot harder to see how colonial territory status is a form of structural racism or how the denial of equal rights to US citizens in the District of Columbia is a form of structural racism. But I think that as our country looks in the mirror, and thinks about how we are going to overcome the current moment that we're in right now and adjust uh, some of the core structures of our democracy to revitalize uh, the core values that are at the heart of what really makes us a nation and, and gives us the potential to be a force of good in the world, um, that addressing the you know, twin evils of uh, structural racism in the case of, you know, unequal citizenship for the citizens of the district and colonial territory status for the citizens of Puerto Rico has to be something that's at the table. And I think that w there's an opening now for people to be aware of that. And we have to use this moment, build on it, not, you know, reduce everything to DC and Puerto Rico are the same, because it's a different, you know, demographic, it's a different history, it's a different constitutional situation. You know, we have to acknowledge those differences, but say, you know, both of them are things that need to be dealt with. Okay. Um, one other thing, you know, we've been going, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about, you know, why DC needs to be a state, why Puerto Rico needs to be a state, but, uh, but what happens afterwards, right? Like after uh, DC and Puerto Rico are made states, what would be the challenges for these two new, uh, these two new states basically? What would be the, the main challenges that they would have to face moving forward? Well, you know, like I said before, once DC becomes a state, our lives will change completely. You know, we will be able to control our resources. Our legislation will change. Our, our council will actually grow. There was actually a, a constitution of the new state of Columbia that was drafted, I believe in 2016, that addressed how our judges will now have to be DC residents, how you know, a lot of our police force will change, how our, our control of our resources will change, how our National Guard will now be under the mayor's control, or the governor, what we actually would be having at that point. It's just important for people to know how our lives will change and what cost there will be because there will be things that will have to go. There will be things that we will have to um, address. Like our Medicare will have to be addressed because right now it's mostly federal employee, I mean, federally um, paid for. Now DC residents will have to 
almost split 50 50. So there are definitely a lot of opportunities to educate the community how lives will change. But however, the cost will be greatly, greatly, greatly rewarding because we're going to have much more control over our resource and we'll be able to control our direction of life. We'll be able to control what happens in DC from this on forward without intervention from the government. We'll no longer be second class citizens. Okay. Mr. Laws Garcia, uh, your thoughts? What would, yeah. what would be some of the big things that Puerto Rico would have to deal with? Uh, once well, it becomes you know, a state? what's interesting is that, you know, other than the federal oversight board that was approved in PROMESA, the state government structure in Puerto Rico under its current territory status will basically remain the same. The, the key thing is that equality um, in federal programs and under federal laws will need to be implemented in a way that effectively uses those resources to bring about an equal level of you know quality of life for the u.s citizens in the territory so you know a, a big challenge is going to be to make sure that as those additional resources flow in that they actually make it out to all of the citizens in uh, the right way uh, so that we can have that citizen equality and then people can actually focus on you know developing to their full potential um you know and and have Puerto Rico's economy fully uh, develop. And, and that's something that obviously would help us, but ultimately it also creates jobs stateside because there's about $70 billion worth of interstate commerce that happens right now between Puerto Rico and the states and under statehood that would obviously increase. Um, so uh, the challenge I think will be a challenge of mindset more than anything for a lot of the residents in Puerto Rico that have been kind of pushed into a more mm -hmm. insular mentality, they're actually going to have to engage proactively in being full participants in the national issues and debates that are impacting our country as a whole. Because, you know, right now as a territory, a lot of times we want to have an opinion on things, but our opinion isn't heard. So a lot of people are like, eh, well, you know, I'll just focus on what I can have power over. Um, which oftentimes is just more narrow local concerns. And the reality is that, you know, Puerto Rico as a state and DC as a state are going to have a huge impact on the potential for the American federal system to be more responsive to our nation's uh, needs and uh, to not be uh, tied to the level of reactiveness and dysfunctionality in our legislative process, which, you know, we've seen. Uh, permeate our political system in the past couple of decades. Okay. All right. Well, uh, like I was saying earlier, this is something that we could probably go get into for days and weeks at this point. But um, I can imagine that many of the people that are listening uh, to this conversation right now, it's a very uh, important conversation. They would like to know uh, some of the steps that they could take to, to, to make these things happen. So um, question for both of y'all, you know, what are some things uh, some concrete steps that people can take in order to make statehood for Puerto Rico and DC a reality. Oye, let's start with you. Yes, everybody has a role to play at the end of the day, whether you can write your representative, whether you can tell your friends about DC statehood. A lot of people, one thing that kind of inhibited us in the past in terms of the fight for DC statehood compared to other issues is that a lot of the fight around DC statehood seemed localized. You know, they didn't realize that people in California talk about DC at the dinner table. It, it wasn't until Senator Strauss and the Students for Statehood in 5151 went to Iowa and created the Iowans for DC Statehood chapter. They kind of realized that we can take this on the road. You know, a lot of the energy could be spent on galvanizing people around this country to support DC Statehood. Another thing, DC residents, get involved. Learn how our lives will be different under DC Statehood. Learn how our criminal justice system will now be accountable to the residents of D.C., not accountable to the occupants of the White House. Um, something else as well to really understand is that you can, use, you can activate social media. Get involved. Listen to what people talk about D.C. Statehood. John Oliver had a, had a clip about D.C. Statehood about a month ago, uh, about a year ago. It really made a big difference in terms of pushing the national attention to DC statehood and untapping our potential, allowing us to really get involved in the lawmaking process. If the squad in the House of Representatives can make such a big difference on how things are running in the House of Representatives, imagine how 
a representative and two senators in D.C. can really impact our national policy and lawmaking. Okay. All right. And George, what are your thoughts? So the first thing I would say is I'm putting in the chat um, a link uh, to the, the sign up uh, form on uh, PR 51st, our website. So everyone right now can feel free to go and, and log on there and, and sign up uh, to be a supporter. Um, the good thing is there's no incompatibility in supporting DC statehood and supporting statehood for Puerto Rico. You can support both and the reality is they're actually consistent in, in the core values, which is you know, citizen equality. Um, so, so that's something immediate. And, and through that mechanism, you know, we're gonna be sending out information and messages about you know, different actions that we're gonna be organizing and ways that we're gonna be targeting Congress. Um, but I think another way that we can uh, take action and support each other um, is also uh, by actually showing up um, and, and participating in each other's events. You know, for me, um, this is a first step uh, in that direction, and I welcome the outreach uh, and opportunity to engage, um, you know, D.C. statehood supporters. Um, I also want to make sure that uh, Puerto Rico statehood supporters are aware that, you know, we're not alone in this challenge of disenfranchisement. Um, and we don't have to be scared of coming together with other voices, even though the situation's different. Um, ultimately, I think that as citizens of this country, what brings us together is our unity. And if we can, you know, stand united in support of each other's cause, um, I think that there's, there's an opportunity to, to grow our respective movements, even if we have different backgrounds, different situations. Um, so I think that that's something that I would, you know, definitely try to leave everyone here with. Okay. All right. Well, thank you both so much for, for contributing to this conversation. We definitely appreciate it. Uh, again, uh, for you, all those of you all just joining in, as we have just been hearing from George Laws Garcia, who is the Executive Director of Puerto Rico Statehood Council, and uh, Oye Olewa, who is the candidate for the U.S. Shadow Representative from DC. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much. This was a, an amazing conversation and uh, we, I know I've definitely learned a lot tonight and uh, hopefully we can move forward. It's very informative. Thank you. Thank you so much.